Starting in a small area around Medina, they moved rapidly out of the Arabian Peninsula and within a few decades had taken control of the Levant, North Africa, Spain and Persia. I think one must bear in mind that this is an era in which people actually believed in God and the dramatic successes of the Arabs as they poured out of Arabia uh, was such that a lot of people did sort of observe and say they must have God on their side, this must be the true God. And some people did convert or if they didn't convert they did submit to Arab Muslim political control for that reason. By the early 8th century Islamic caliphs ruled a vast territory. And like most successful emperors, from Caesar to Napoleon, they understood that political power and scientific know-how go hand in hand. There were many reasons for this. Some were practical. Medical knowledge could save lives. Military technology could win wars. Mathematics could help deal with the increasing complexities of the finances of state. And Islam as a religion also played a pivotal role. The Prophet himself had told believers to seek knowledge wherever they could find it, even if they had to go as far as China. And many Muslims, I'm sure, felt that to study and better understand God's creation was in itself a religious duty. But there were also other less edifying motives at play. To many in the ruling elite of the Islamic empire, knowledge itself had a self-serving purpose because possessing it was seen as proof of the new empire's superiority over the rest of the world. But with military and political success, the Islamic caliphs faced an inevitable problem. How do you sensibly govern a hugely diverse population? Although some of the empire had converted to Islam, they were still separated by huge distances and adhered to many different traditions and languages. In the 8th century AD, the empire's leader, the caliph Abdul Malik, had to find a way of administering this mishmash of languages. Like all the great figures of the Islamic empire, Abdul Malik lived in a culture without portraiture. All we have are later impressions of what he might have looked like. His solution was sweeping in scale and inadvertently laid the foundations of a scientific renaissance. It was this Abdul Malik ibn Marwan who said, this bureaucratic chaos has to stop. We cannot continue to run the government. And govern all of this span of land with this uh, uh, tower of Babel languages. So he wanted to govern it with a uniform language. That uniform language, of course, he wanted to be able to understand it, so he demanded that it be in Arabic. But the choice of Arabic as the common language of the empire went beyond administrative convenience. The decision had extra force and persuasiveness because Islam's holy book, the Qur'an, is in Arabic and Muslims therefore consider Arabic to be the language of God. The words of the Qur'an are so sacred that its text hasn't changed in over 1400 years. By comparison, English has changed dramatically in just 700 years. To our ears, Chaucer is almost unintelligible, whereas any Quran can be understood by anyone who reads Arabic. Making copies of the Quran has always been a specialized and highly respected job since the foundation of Islam. Calligraphy expert Naif Scarf, who lives in the Syrian capital Damascus, writes for mosques and in madrasas all over the country. These are words he's found himself writing over and over again, words of great significance for Muslims. They're the opening line to each chapter in the Quran. So it, what it says is, Bism illa 
Rahman Rahim. Which means, in the name of God, the most gracious and the most merciful. Ah. So he's saying the complexity of Arabic calligraphy was enforced on them because of the spread of Islam, because they were worried that the meaning of the words in the Quran would be lost uh, if it was read by people who don't speak Arabic. Then they wouldn't, not only would they misinterpret it, they just wouldn't be able to distinguish between different letters. So not only did they add dots on certain letters, they also added other little squiggly lines which changed the sound of vowels. And it was something that they put in place just to ensure that people were able to have the right pronunciation when they read the Quran. The consequences for science were immediate. Scholars from different lands who previously had no way of communicating now had a common language. And it was a language that was specially developed to be precise and unambiguous, which made it ideal for scientific and technical terms. What this meant was the summoning into existence of a vast intellectual community where scholars from very different parts of the world could engage in dialogue, comparison, debate, argument, often very fierce argument, with each other. It was possible for scholars based in Cordoba in southern Spain to engage in literary and scientific debate with scholars from Baghdad or from uh, Samarkand. But I can tell you that scholars aren't motivated by the love of knowledge alone. There's nothing like a large hunk of cash to focus the mind. By the early 800s, the ruling elite of the Islamic Empire were pouring money into a truly ambitious project, which was global in scale and which was to have a profound impact on science. It was to scour the libraries of the world for scientific and philosophical manuscripts in any language. Greek, Syriac, Persian and Sanskrit. Bring them to the empire and translate them into Arabic. This became known as the translation movement. scholars put into finding ancient texts was astonishing. And one key reason for this is that bringing a book to the caliph, which you could add to his library, could be extremely lucrative. The story goes that the caliph al Ma'mun was, was so obsessed that he would send his messengers out of Baghdad far and wide to distant lands just to get hold of books that he didn't possess for the translation movement. And anyone who brought him back a book that he didn't have he'd repay him its weight in gold. To give some sense of the extent of this activity, sort of between 750 and 950, um, somebody called Anadim, who wrote a list of sort of the intelligentsia of the Abbasid era, lists 70 translators. So it was quite a large cohort of people involved in translation. And obviously he only named the well-known they could get up to 500 gold dinars a month, which is probably around $24,000, which is a huge sum of money for what they were doing. It was a very, very prestigious, well-paid, well-patronized activity. And motivating this global acquisition of knowledge was a pressing practical concern, one that rarely crosses our minds today. This is the new library at Alexandria in Egypt. But fresh in the memory of many in the empire was the story of the destruction of the original library at Alexandria centuries earlier and the shocking loss of thousands of years of accumulated knowledge. One of the things that we tend to forget because we live in an age of massive information storage and perfect communication, more or less, um, is the ever-present possibility of total loss. 
That was very, very important for medieval Islamic scholars. They knew extremely well that writings could be forgotten or buried or burnt or destroyed, that cities could pass away. And what we see in Baghdad or Cairo or Samarkand is exactly the gathering together, translation, analysis, accumulation, storage and preservation of material that they were well aware could be entirely lost forever.